This is a quick video on the 18th edition exam and a few tips and a bit of guidance. Before we start, let's look at the numbering system used in the book. So we have a regulation number, 411.1. How does that come about? So the first digit signifies a part, part four, protection for safety. The second digit is a chapter. So 41 will be the first chapter of part four, protection against electric shock. Then the third digit, one, this will be the first section of chapter 41, automatic disconnection of supply. Then any subsequent numbers after that will be the regulation number 411.1. And that is general. And you can see it here. Automatic disconnection of supply is a protective measure. So it goes part four, chapter 41, 411, 411.1. Then subsequent parts of 411 explain how AGS is achieved. So 411.2, that's a requirement for basic protection for AGS. There's about 48 regulations in this sequence, sequentially numbered, plus notes and tables, all to do with automatic disconnection of the supply. 411.8.5, requirements for circuits, is the last in this sequence. Then we move on to the next section, Chapter 41, 412. 412, protective measures, double or reinforced insulation, and so on. You'll get the subsequent regs after that. So the 18th edition exam is a qualification to demonstrate that you have an understanding of BS 7671, the wiring regulations. It's a level three qualification, and that's supposed to demonstrate an advanced level of knowledge and competence. So you do need a good level of understanding of electrical theory and practice before you come in to take this exam. The exam is known as Open Book. You can actually take BS 7671 into the exam with you. People often ask, can you mark the pages? You can use bookmarks to indicate the chapters. You're not allowed to take in anything that will give you any guidance, past papers and such. Just simple bookmarks to help you speed up navigation of the book. But we're going to go through that. The questions are arranged as to the order of the book. Some sections have more questions and therefore a larger percentage of the mark. It's graded a pass or a fail and the minimum pass rate is around 60%, which means you can get 24 questions wrong and still pass. But we don't want to get any questions wrong. We can do better than that. We want to get them all. Because I think studying isn't just about passing the exam. Of course, that's important. But it's about improving yourself and building confidence in what you can do. That all being said, I do understand when you actually sit in your exam, passing it is your main focus and you don't want to come back for a resit. And training is expensive. So here's a few basic tips about getting through the exam, but always keep in mind that bigger picture. It's very common for people to get a bit nervous when they sit in an exam and it can muddy your thinking a little bit. So it's a good idea to be as prepared as you possibly can be before you go into the exam. Obviously, have a good understanding of the subject, but little things that count as well, so you're not flapping around on the day just before the exam, looking for some paper, looking for a pen, a calculator. Have BS 7671 with you. I see people trying to borrow one off the course tutor. Get there early and settle yourself. An hour or two before the exam, don't be cramming through the book trying to get last little bits of information. Just be relaxed before you go into the exam. You've got two hours. That's quite a long time. You've got 60 questions, but some questions you're going to answer instantly. And some will take a little bit of consideration, and some need some calculation. But just make sure you read the question and read it again. Make sure you're actually understanding what they're wanting. But if you're not sure about the answer, put your best answer and flag it. You can always come back to it later. But never leave anything blank, because you might forget, you might run out of time. And you definitely won't get it right if you don't put something down. And it's easy to lose marks by misreading how the question is worded. And you can be misled by being given information from other publications, regulations and standards. BS 7671 tells you the type of wording it uses in the introduction. If something's a requirement, it shall. If it's a recommendation, it should. And they can use that in the questions. And when you're in a rush, the wording can be a bit confusing. Double negatives. Which of the following should not be omitted? You've got to read that as should be included. Which of the following is not a requirement of BS 7671? All these four things are true, but D is not part of BS 7671. It's ESQCR. 
And again, which of the following is not part of BS 7671, A, B, C and D? They're all correct. Assessment of general characteristics is not part two, it's part three. So they can be a little bit sneaky with the wording. I presume they do it to see that you're concentrating and reading the question so they can change things very subtly. You know the answer, but it's easy to muck it up. And I see it quite a lot, people panicking a bit in the exam, flicking backwards and forwards through the book, trying to find an answer, more in hope. Navigating through the book is not that difficult. If you don't know the answer to a question, start with the contents page. Think, what is the question asking me? Does it sound like it's a fundamental principle? Does it sound like it's a safety thing? Does it sound like it's something to do with selection or erection of equipment? Is it about testing? You get a very good idea where you should be in the book from how the question's phrased. But remember, the questions are in order of the book. So that's going to give you a very good indication where to look to confirm your answer. We don't want to be at the level where we're looking for the answer. We want to be at the level where we understand the question and we have an answer. And sometimes you just want to confirm it because you start down yourself. Some questions might be a particular value though. A maximum earth fault loop impedance value, for example. You're not going to remember all them, but knowing where to find it is the key. This is all from the City and Girls website, the amount of questions you get per section. And as you can see, protection for safety, quite rightly, has the most questions, as does selection and erection of equipment. But the first four questions are going to be on scope. You get a couple on definitions. You get about six or seven on the assessment of the general characteristics. Then about 15 on protection for safety, 14 on selection and erection, you get about 5 on inspection and testing, about 8 on special installations and locations, and about the same on section 8, prosumer equipment. That also includes the appendices as well. So as you can see as you go through the exam, you know where you're supposed to be in the book. That can take a little bit of pressure off you when you're trying to confirm that your answer is right. Here's another example of how they might phrase a question. Sometimes you ask a question where they might just change one word. An example being, which of these is a general requirement? Safe operation and proper functioning, or safe operation and practical functioning? You know it, but which one is it? Questions like that. It's good to be able to navigate to the section, just confirm your answer. So this can help you if you get a bit nervous during the exam. So BS7671 is organised. So that fundamental principles are set out first, followed by actual requirements and application. So in part one, scope, objects and fundamental principles, these are the core concepts. It defines the objectives of the regulations, scope, safety of persons and such, mentions principles like protection against electric shock, design, environmental conditions and isolation, but it gives an overview of it. It doesn't go into the detail. This is just your fundamental principles. Then we have definitions, which is a descriptive list of the terms used in BS 7671. Then we move on to part three, which is assessment of the general characteristics. This part outlines the key considerations, like what is the installation's intended use, any influences the installation might be exposed to, its compatibility with other equipment and services, power supplies, earthing systems, and the division of the installation into circuits. Then the rest of the book is how we translate these fundamental principles into practical application. So parts 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8, these give us the actual rules, regulations, methods, examples, specifications, installation methods, and important values like earth fault loop impedance, current carrying capacity, to help with the actual nuts and bolts of the installation. So having good knowledge of the structure of the book will really help you during the exam. Not just during the exam, in your day-to-day -day job as being an electrician. You understand the book, you know where things are in the book. If you've got a question, you know where to look. Something we want to use all year round, not just for an exam. Just going to look through two quick questions, just to give you an example. So once you understand the book, you'll be able to read questions and know which part of the book they're referring to. So what is the primary purpose of proving overcut and protection in an electrical installation? Now they're asking for a primary purpose. So we know that's going to be toward the beginning of the book. And you've got the answers A, B, C or D. And we can go straight to the regulation because we know whereabouts it is. 
Persons and livestock shall be protected against injury and property shall be protected against damage. So there we go, we know the answer is C. So here we go again with another question on overload current. Which of the following devices may be used to provide protection against both overload and short circuit currents? It's not asking a fundamental principle. It's asking for a specific example. And you should have a good idea of what the answer is. But you might just want to check. So you would start at the contents page. Overload and short circuit currents. You'll be thinking about protection and protection for safety. And that is part four. So we've got the contents, protection for safety. Look through the contents, and there we have it. Protection against overcurrents. And we can see in the section Nature of Protective Devices, 432.1, protection against both overload currents and fall currents. It's all there, written down for us to find. A device providing protection against both overload and fall currents should be capable of breaking, and for a circuit breaker, making any overcurrent. And you can see it's really quite simple to find the answers if you just do it methodically. So that was just a quick look at navigating the regulations. I've got more examples of questions and such on my Instagram account, which is at JPE7671. And I've also got some downloadable PDFs of this content and other content on my website. So thanks for watching and keep safe.